Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to From the Ground Up. I'm Carmen Milagro. I'm your host and the founder of Divina Skincare Botanicals. The reason for this show is really to talk about successful transformations in business and life. Uh, we talk about health. We talk about wellness. We, with the end result being, how do you balance it all? Some people are very hard on one side of this topic and they say you can't have it all. Some people say you've just got to power through and, you know, different people have different opinions. So, you know, it, it for me, the successful transformation starts with the truth about your work-life balance from the ground up and the inside out. And on this show, it's a quest to find out these truths and nuggets of wisdoms and strategies from the best of the best, industry leaders, best-selling authors, musicians, artists, captains of industry, real estate investors, you name it, because everyone's journey is different. And I'm hoping that their stories will resonate with you and help you. So that's pretty much it. It's, you know, people from all walks of life. I'm here to find out their truths. Is work-life balance truly possible? Or is that sort of this myth that... Uh, that people are perpetuating. Today, I am very, very excited to bring you an incredible guest. He is a modern day Renaissance man, a real estate artist. He's a seven time international best selling author. He's an ultra marathoner. He's also an actor and an aspirational speaker. And he sees opportunities and he creates realities where none existed before. That's pretty magical. And we'll get into that because he's going to share some of that information with us. But he also considers himself, and I, I love this word, by the way, he considers himself a philanthro capitalist. So welcome to the show, Mr. Frank McKinney. Hi, Frank. I think last time I saw you, I was on fire on the back of a jet ski or on the yes. front of a jet ski and there was yes. fire coming out behind me. <laughs> yes, that is true. I, I think that's actually, that's a great place to start, Frank. Thank you. Because you and I, I the first time that I ever knew or heard of Frank McKinney was in 2019 in November at an event, Mega Success. You were one of the speakers on stage and I was blown away by what you shared with us the the wisdom and the knowledge that you gave us all. And then the next time um, we did an interview together for another show that I used to host. And then I got to go to your book launch, which by the way, it's right here. It sits on my desk, Frank. <laughs> Chapter 11 is my go-to place. And we can talk about that a little bit too, but you have, by attending your book launch, you completely altered my definition of book launch. So let's talk about that event and then the subsequent journey that you've been on. Let's do that. Well, it was it was 11, 11, um, November 11th, 11, 11, that you and maybe a little bit more than 111 people, I think we oversold it a little bit because <laughs> I want as many people to come as possible were at this book launch experience really is what it was and a party for my seventh book where um you can go to my website you can see a little video a two-minute video you're one of the lucky ones that actually has a qr code that takes you to a special video that only the attendees are allowed to see it's on your special book there but yep. basically we, we we invited 150 or so of our closest friends at to my house on the ocean here in delray there was a fire archer that ignited the night by shooting an arrow out into the ocean that ignited the back of a jet ski that I was riding on. And we were riding in the waves with this, these fireworks and flames coming off the jet ski. Uh, then we, we beached it. We, then we took you guys to a special location where I brought all five sections of my book to life. We did. Through volunteers on this Aspire Altar, spelled A-L-T-E-R, not A-L-T-A-R. And it was very interactive. It was immersionary. I wanted to make sure that people, you know, it's not just some guy staying up there talking for two hours. Like I wanted to bring people up there and have them experience it. So you, it was amazing. I mean, I tell you that, that video and that night was one of the best nights of my life. Oh, well, for, for all of us there in attendance too, thank you for creating this, you know, like you created this where 
It didn't exist before. I would not have imagined something like this before. Now, of course, my brain is on fire. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, you spend a book, by the way, a book, I've written seven of them. You know, if you're a woman, it takes nine months to birth a baby. Typically, a book is about twice that. So I think an elephant or a giraffe has a gestation period of 15 right. months or whatever. That's what it's like, you know. And so I wanted everybody to be a part of that coming out party. Uh, and, and at the same time, for those who were there, you know, you donated to our Caring House Project to get one of those 150 or 111 tickets. And, you know, that was big because you helped us build, we'll be building our 30th self-sustaining village in Haiti. So I, I make no money from that. I don't make, I'm, I make it not a dime from the sale of my books. Like all the money goes to our caring house. I made money in real estate, but I really felt like to, to have people there that night and to see how, you know, kind of show business the theatricality meets a book launch because right. listen, Carmen, there's 2,350 books. that will be launched tomorrow that we're not out today. So how do you compete? You got to that the four corners of your book needs to be a business. And, and, and part of being in business is marketing. And that's why we did that book launch party the way we did. It's incredible. And again, I referenced chapter 11. I think I mentioned to you, I, I finished reading the book before I even got home from your event. And chapter 11 is about being the, bringing the artist into your business. And you have, I mean, there you've renovated, or you've renovated, you have created uh, and built these houses on spec from averaging from $14 million to, I think your top one was 50 million. Is that right? Right. Right. And, and the way that you have done that, where I've seen videos and photos of your work and it's your team effort. Um, I learned that. I didn't know that before I went to your event at your house, but it's a team effort. You and your wife, your beautiful wife, Nilsa, she designs it, right? You design it. Yeah. So what we do, Carmen, is we build these on speculation. I mean, we do not have a buyer. So like an artist that would like Van Gogh, Renoir, Monet would paint a painting and then put it up for sale. That's what we do. I build three-dimensional art. It might look like I can sing or play an instrument or sculpt. I can paint a little bit, but not very well. My art is three-dimensional. And so we build these three-dimensional art that people can live in on that beach. I point over there because I'm in my tree house in the beach, which you were in my tree house. Right over there is where it all happens. And over there, meaning on the Atlantic Ocean. Right. And Nilsa does all the interiors. So when we we furnish them down to the gold plated toothbrush in the bathroom, you know, linens on the beds and towels in the closet. So people can walk in the door on a Tuesday and be sleeping there on a Friday, as long as their check clears. Right. <laughs> well, of course the details, but, but my point being is you two are these artists that create these spectacular homes. And what you said earlier, before we started recording the show, I really would love for people to understand that, you know, I struggled uh, quite a bit in the corporate world because I was too artsy, you know, too creative for the business world. But then in the music world, I I talk about the business of music and I would bring up, you know, all these business discussions. So I just ended up creating my own path, calling myself an entrepreneur. And I love how you've also taken all of this and you are a philanthropic capitalist. Can you talk a little bit about that part of being, you know, this creative artist, business person, and then parlaying it into changing the world? Because that's what you're doing. Yeah, two separate discussions. Really, taking an artist's approach to your craft is a little bit different than being a philanthropic capitalist. And I'll, I'll explain the difference in the two. So I implore people in business to do what you did, be an entrepreneur artist, is, and, and basically learn to train the right side of the brain, which is the creative side. Many of you watching this and listening to this will say, oh, that's easy. I've grown up as a creative, but my partner, they ha he handles or she handles the business side, you know, the statistical analytical side. My left brain is 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 dormant. It, it never it never came to life. Well, that is an unfortunate thing that we are taught from a very early age by our parents and by our teachers that you're one or the other right brain or left brain. So uh, believe it or not, I came to Florida, I came into business as a left brain dominant individual having very little right brain, right brain creativity. And I said, I don't want that. I want to awaken the synapses of the right side of the brain so that I could be creative. Everybody thinks, oh, you're this artist. Well, I didn't come down into business that way. I was extremely analytical and statistical because my grandfather and father were bankers. So 
taking an artist approach to your craft says I'm going to awaken your craft being business. Okay. Right. I'm going to awaken the right side of my brain so that I can toggle back and forth in nanoseconds between right brain, left brain, the people that you look up to in business, let's say Elon Musk, for example, do you, you know, for a fact that when he thinks about putting a SpaceX rocket up into the atmosphere, he thinks right brain and creativity and, and then his left brain, the, the maybe the engineer in him says, well, how am I going to land that rocket right back down where it took off? And when it's up there, I'm going to drop off a few satellites and make a couple hundred million dollars. So the people that you look up to have that ability. The rest of us believe we're either right brain or left brain. That is untrue. Take an artist approach to your craft. Do not cut corners. If, if you were Van Gogh, Renoir, Monet, or Manet, or any of your Michelangelo's, you wouldn't go into the paint store and buy the cheapest paint, the cheapest brush, or the cheapest palette, you would buy the best. And I, I have said, and I've seen it reprinted since this book came out, sacrifice your bottom line for your reputation. Build your ROI is in direct proportion to your ROR, your return on reputation. So that that is so important to, that's, that's what an artist would do. He's gonna sacrifice his bottom line, exactly. make less money to be, true to his or her craft exactly musicians are the same authors like that is exactly it and when you reach that level of understanding it just changes the, the whole everything the outcome like you said it alters your dna when you start doing this i'm you know i'm taking that that page from your book um but but i do see and and this is where i would love for you to clarify a little bit deeper is for me, in the world of artists, I've noticed that no matter how I want to, I, I don't like using that, you know, starving artist. I've never believed in that term. Um, but no matter how financially, you know, uh, struggled an artist is, somehow, some way, Artists are many, many times the first ones to give back to the community, not just with their art, but of their time and they donate their services. And, you know, so I do feel like there is this sort of, I don't know how to explain it, but the artist's heart to me is also that beautiful part of being an artist, which in turn, if you're in business, this term that you coined, philanthrocapitalist, is so intriguing to me because I do see it tied to your heart. Yeah, so so when it comes, let's, let's stay on the artist, then we'll go to the philanthrocapitalist. So, so when it comes to the artist, and, and let's, for the sake of your, your discuss, our discussion, I, I if you want to be a starving artist, that's cool. But how are you going to eat? It, there's, it, too many, there's too many proud, starving artists out there that are, I'm an artist and I'm living in this loft and I have no money. Well, I, I'm a businessman first and an artist a distant second. I allow the artist to infiltrate the business mind because I want to be creative and I want to be innovative. And that's what's rewarded in business today, creativity and ingenuity. That's why I'm coming to you for my treehouse. Right. All my houses I design are in my treehouse. All the books, every one of my books, all seven were written right here from this desk. I've been up here for 20 years. I mean, I go home at night. I haven't stayed here. <laughs> But, but that that part, I mean, if you are an artist and you're using it to make money as a living, I would ask you to question the mirror, look in the mirror. Are you proud of being a starving artist? And if you are, great. You know, right. it's good. Continue. But we need to make money. Philanthrocapitalism. So philanthrocapitalism is taking the best of philanthropy, getting rid of the worst. The worst to me is charity. Charity exacerbates poverty, does nothing to do to solve the problem. Nothing so there are there is a time and a place for charity, Carmen. And I, I mean, we've been in Haiti building self-sustaining villages for 20 years now. And I know when there's time for charity, but we we coined the phrase philanthrocapitalist because I want to provide a self-sustaining existence in the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, that being Haiti, which we have done for over 13,000 children and their families. Those children that were eating dirt flavored with bouillon and lemon juice. That's what your purchase of Aspire went to, and that's what your you know your ticket to my party went to. So you take you take the best of philanthropy, which is the heart, as you refer to unequivocally. It's the heart of the giver. You know, God loves a cheerful giver, so we're giving from the heart. We're, I am getting rid of charity as a means to support 
the the indigent and the poor because it it doesn't solve the problem i've seen it where it just exacerbates and makes it worse then you take the best of capitalism which is the ability to make money through innovation you marry the two and you have 29 self-sustaining villages that we have built in the poorest country in the western hemisphere not one of those villages have ever called us back and said we need more help we need more money i'm 29 for 29 all of them are thriving and they know going in carmen that when we're done there's no more help they either make it or they don't on their own because i don't listen I'm not going to get political yet. The the entitlement programs and the welfare programs are absolutely 100% fine. I believe in the program. I do not believe in an entitlement mentality. A a welfare mentality very toxic. There's a big difference between the absolutely. program. Every once in a while, you know, you need a little help. Yes. Everyone needs a little help. I get that, and I agree with you a thousand percent. That's what it's for. That's right. what, listen, if you go back to welfare and entitlements, it goes back to, it predates the Roman era. And then in our country, it started in about, yeah, actually after the Great Depression, when people in 1930, in the 1930s, people needed it right. as a hand right. up, you know, a, right. help, a helping hand, you know, pull you up by the boots. And then you move on. But too often you kind of get used to that entitlement that's coming your way without having to earn it. That's not the way we do things over in Haiti. That's amazing, Frank. I, I want to also focus on a little bit before we get into, you know, sort of finding that balance. You have done all these things. You are all these things. You after you had your book launch, you didn't just go and rest, which right, I, anyone and anyone would have done. It was a, that was a big undertaking of coordination. And you were, you know, in the spotlight and you had all these details for this event, it was a spectacular event. I cannot stress that enough. I, you know, I used to do event planning. I used to work in the hotel business. I, I know. But you took off within hours and you went on this tour, the book tour for Aspire. Yeah. You didn't, like you didn't take a breath. So, so I appreciate the fact that you were an event planner because there were so many little moving parts and pieces to your experience that I wanted to make sure went seamlessly. There were a dozen little nuances besides the jet ski on fire and the fire archer and the uh, fire altar and all that. And, and it, it came, it came off flawlessly. So, so, so that's great for the people who got to experience it. But the purpose of writing the book is to get the message out to the world. So you're right immediately, not immediately, like the, two days later, we embarked on the Aspire book tour, which was a very, I would call it an anti book tour because yes. typical book tour. Well, right now, typical book tours are zoom. No authors are on the road. Nobody's out there doing it. So we right. said, okay, we're not zooming this thing. Uh, I'm getting on the road and typical. Cause I've, you know, listen, I've toured five of the seven of my books. Typical book tour is TV, radio, right. print podcast. And we did those. Of course we did those. But we stopped at homeless shelters, soup kitchens, food pantries, detention centers, abused women's facilities. I did two of those and treatment facilities to deliver the message of Aspire. And really, when you strip it all down, the message of hope to people who really needed to hear it. So, Carmen, we I met face to face, shook the hands of close to 2000 homeless people or near homeless people in at 27 different venues, meaning 27 different times we presented the message of Aspire in 24 cities in 23 days, over 7,000 miles. You're like the second or third interview since I got home. I only got home two days ago. I know. You know, but but that the meaning of, well, I know we tried to do it while I was on tour, but we kept, we kept messing up the time. It was, that was on me, but it was just, um, and pretty soon, you know, I'm not sure when this will air, but you'll see a four minute highlight reel of me presenting the message of Aspire to people who had lost everything. The last thing I wanted them to lose was hope. Correct. And I think I've read, the, like I said, I've read it cover to cover. I intend to read it again and again and again. And I think that that is the one thing that if you, when you're reading this book, if you don't come away with that sense of, wait a minute, 
there is hope for me. And the reason I'm saying that is because you know what it's like. You you left your the place where you grew up, where you were born. You left with fifty dollars in your pocket to start a brand new life in Florida. Yeah. So you I didn't know, have I know. all this handed to you. When I'm talking to these homeless people, a lot of them are homeless men. A lot of them are, are minorities. I know what it's like to stay outside. I know because when I moved here, I didn't have a place to stay. I slept under the pier on the sand because it was softer than sleeping on the concrete. So I, I have instant credibility and I, I, I believe in them. Like I cared. And if, and if we can get through to 10% of them, that's 200 people that turn. If it's 1%, Carmen, that's yeah. 20 people. That's right. Through, through what? Through the sub, what you just referenced. Through the subtitle, I want them to kill the person they were born to be to become the person they want to be, to, to right. alter the DNA. And yes. it's possible if okay. I've done it, and, and it's not just if I've done it. I can't stand when people say that. If I've done it, you can do it. My book contains examples of a lot of people that I looked up to, that I admire, that you may know if you you know you read the book, that yes. they've done it too. So altering your DNA and creating your own reality through aspiration is the... Like, I hope this comes out before New Year's because if people are already starting to talk about their New Year's resolutions. Those never last. Exactly. So think about New Year's aspirations because those stay with you longer than a tattoo will stay with you. <laughs> right. They stay in the soul. Yes. They stay deep in the soul. Absolutely. And I do, I, I want to, I think we're going to have to do a part two, but I want to talk about, you know, again, your willpower, your drive, your passion for what you're doing. A lot of people in our age group, Frank, I think we're pretty close in age, don't have the stamina, the energy. They can't do what you do. I mean, do you, I want to talk about sort of the, your, your wellness philosophy, your wellness what do you draw from? In other That's words, so you ask that because I just the, the <laughs> interview I just did before you is is through a company that has provided me with some you know healthcare products for almost thirty years, and so they, I'm a spokesperson for them. Okay. And and we got into the depth of, and that's not something I talk about often. Is mm -hmm. you know think about this for a minute. So twenty seven venues in in twenty four cities in okay. twenty three days, presenting you know, and then getting in the car and driving four hundred miles. Mm -hmm. I am no mask. I am in front of homeless people that are, you know, on the street, a lot of germs. Right. And yet I had plenty of energy and came home at least so far. I haven't come down with any illness and I've not had COVID or any of that other stuff. Not going so, so, you know, the, the, it would be interesting to do a part two when we can get into, you know, yeah. health regimen because yeah. health, mind and body regimen, what I do to keep myself sharp and healthy. Um, it's critical. It really okay. is because it allows me to have that energy level that I can sustain until I, then I hit the pillow and I'm out. Like I don't, <laughs> I'm not like this all the time, but, but it, it is important. Like as simple as I drink a gallon of water a day, as simple as drinking a gallon. Like when I wake up in the morning, I don't do caffeine. I'm really sensitive to caffeine, so I can't do it, but I drink a liter of water without taking a breath. I know that sounds odd, but the first thing in the morning, I take this kind of si size liter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I drink it without breathing, the whole thing. And within three, two to three minutes, my brain is wide awake. Interesting. Now, that is a tip for you all that are trying to figure out this whole work-life balance thing. Because when we're talking about being on the road for 23, it's like, it, it is like, you know, a musician or a band. I mean, that's my world too, you know. And how do you, how... I, I do think it's so important. Yes, you feed off the energy of other people. No question. As artists, as you know, as an author, when you're on tour, that is something that sustains your soul and it feeds you. But I'm also very practical and pragmatic. I want to be as healthy as I can be all the time. I, you know, as a CBD educator, right? That's my world. Yep. And that I'm wanting to share that that's that's my purpose through my business of how I want to help people. But I think a lot of times when I've asked this question of other people, they just kind of have this blank look, you know, because I I look at it as what are your wellness values? What's your wellness philosophy? Because I think that's really important. And there is this thing. There's 
there's, it seems to be unfortunate, like so much of our discussions these days, things are divided, but I want to get to this meat of it with you and everyone else is there's this sort of this camp that says, Hey, you, in order to achieve balanced life, you have to make sure you take care of your spirit, make sure you take care of yourself. And then there's the other camp that says, you know, you can't do that. Like you've got to power through and you've got to, to be successful. No, you don't I have time. I, I so. can't stand that word grind. They, yeah. like, rise and grind and grind. I mean, come on, really? You're going to grind through your life? Right. One thing I will say though, Carmen, and this is, you know, I know the name of the program here and, and it's based on balance. And I don't want to shut your program down after the first couple of weeks, but I'm going to tell you my philosophy on balance is as follows. As a species, homeostasis, homeostasis, we were not meant to stay in balance. We, if you think about a grandfather clock and the way that that pendulum swings back and forth, when it stops swinging and it's in balance, we're not moving. We're not growing. So I came to the conclusion, and this might be, you know, I don't, you know, not everybody has to buy into this, but we spent our entire lives out of balance. So quit, quit struggling and, you know, striving and stressing about this thing called balance. If you're a woman and you've been pregnant, you were out of balance for a good reason for nine months. And then after that, probably still out of balance with the newborn. You start a new business. You're out of balance. You're not home because that business is important to you. We're over in Haiti. I've left my family. I'm building another. I'm out of balance. As long as your your this pendulum swing is swinging for constructive good, not destructive bad, then quit trying so hard. Like I can't tell you how many times I get asked, your life seems to be so imbalanced. It's not. Do you think 27? 27 venues in 23 days. I was so far out of balance for the cause, for the book, for the message. And yeah. then I come home and the pendulums will swing in a different direction. Yeah. But I do not want my life's pendulum to stop in the middle because I think if we were all perfectly in balance, I think we'd have a really miserable society. <laughs> well, I'm not, I'm actually not disagreeing with you. I think I find this whole topic is just fascinating because I don't, I haven't been moving at the speed you've been moving or doing all the things that you've been doing. But, you know, I just got back from an event in Florida. I got home with travel and, you know, all that kind of stuff. I got home at 1.30. I was up at four o'clock for a conference call. And once I'm awake, I'm awake. So I had to go to rehearsal, you know, the other day. I mean, all of these things were, it's because I'm so excited and I'm passionate about what I love, what I, I that's one of my definitions for success. I don't really use the word balance, but I do believe in, you know, we're building our life, creating our reality, to quote you. Um, and how are we doing that? How are different people doing that? I, I do maintain that there are some practical tips health wise that we can take, practical approaches to keep us at that optimum level to accomplish what we're trying to accomplish. Yeah. And, and whatever those are, there's nothing new under the sun. We've heard them all. My, my, my approach would be quit beating yourself up over the fact that you can't stay motivated. You can't stay inspired because we weren't meant to stay motivated either. That's why there's a multi-billion dollar industry out there built around motivation. Right. Aspiration is what alters the DNA and causes you to create your own reality. And, aspira and aspiration is an otherworldly passion for your purpose to create something high and great P simply put too much too much emphasis on passion not enough on purpose so i, I want people to focus on this otherworldly passion for their purpose to achieve something high and great that is an aspiration and let's us let's start talking about those going into 2022 versus resolutions because resolutions fade after 22 days right uh, yes, I think. Oh, well, it was something you talked about as well. And I had read that before. I've never, ever made New Year's resolutions. <laughs> I just, I never did. I was, I never really bought into that. I, but I didn't know why. And I didn't have the vocabulary that you've given us through this book to describe why I've never had resolutions. I just do what I do. Right. I do believe in, you know, 
doing what your body needs you to do to maintain that that process that you're in to maintain yeah. your however i i don't need a lot of sleep i know that some people have to have a lot of sleep i've just been wired differently but i will say this when i go to bed the way that i live my life i do believe that that plays a huge part and i can go to this the minute my head hits that pillow i am out like a light because i don't live in regrets. I yeah. don't live my life with, like you said, I don't beat myself up. I'm human. You're human. Um, I have some tools at my disposal that I use that I like to share. And I'm always curious about what other people's tools are that maybe I, I can incorporate that. I'm going to sort of wrap this up a little bit um, in a few minutes, Frank, but with, with your, with your passion, your purpose, your insight and your experience you know that whole thing of keeping healthy so that we can keep after what we're doing can you leave us with maybe three other tips that you do that you find help you operate at that optimum level and they could be you know physical they could be nutritional tips whatever it is that you feel that really helps you stay being Frank McKinney. Okay. So yeah, I want to share stuff that maybe you haven't heard. We all know about how to eat right and all that. So this was the new tip, right? We're drinking that without yes. taking a breath and we're going to drink three more during the day. So that's, that's four liters equals a little bit more than a gallon. That's right. pretty much every day. Now that hasn't been for, but like three years for me. And I can tell you the difference is amazing. By the way, you do close to a gallon a day. It's free weight loss for without doing anything. You you're going to lose weight if you're looking to lose weight. Okay. The other thing that, that you, well, you may have heard it, but it's not very commonly accepted or, or practiced, I would say, is I go to bed real early and I get up very early and I get my physical exercise in because I'm a distance runner. I run ultra marathons, like 100 plus mile races. I do that at four in the morning. Like I can't tell you how, and even if I'm not training for a race, if I'm just in maintenance mode, I might go out of my A1A, which is the road in front of my house, which is right along the ocean at four in the morning and do my six miles, you know, maintenance miles, I can't tell you the creativity and the ingenuity that has come to me while running on that road at that time in the morning. If you, it takes some discipline, it'll take some getting used to, but if you get up early and get that in, you can crash on your couch and eat your potato chips and watch whatever you want to watch at five o'clock. You don't have to worry about a workout. You're done. If you don't get it done early, you'll have a million excuses why you can't get it done late. Sure. That that's something that I have subscribed to for 30 years. I mean, really getting up early. I mean, of course, there's days I don't. I skip days and all that. I'm human. But for the most part, that practice, that disciplined practice of getting up early and getting the, the physical workout in is, is critical. The other thing I would say for, for um, emotional and, and mental health, which is just as important, um, I find that if you're if you're most creative in the morning, then use that time to meditate on creativity. If you're most creative at night, use that time to meditate at night on that strength of yours. When I was writing three books in three genres at the same time, a business book, a spiritual book, and a young reader fantasy novel, I realized that in the morning, I was most creative. Therefore, I wrote the young reader fantasy novel. In the afternoon and day, during the day, I was in the business mode, so I wrote the real estate book. And at night, I would start writing my spiritual book because I was more in my Bible and things like that. So I, I, there's times of the day when you're going to be stronger spiritually, um, creativity, create creatively, and business wise. Use those, find those times of day when your brain adapts better, and that's when you want to do your praying. In my case, or motive, or uh, meditating if you're into meditation. Right. That's fabulous. It, Thank it, you. You'll find you'll find the time of day if you say, okay, so I want to be creative. I need to meditate on something creative. There is a time in your rhythm where you will be more creative, and that's when you want to meditate on that. Right. Oh, I love that. And again, you're giving me these words and these these concepts that I kind of relate to, but I never had the actual. I wasn't ever able to articulate. I can't articulate it right now, but. Uh, yeah, you're really giving me these concepts. And I think that is one of the reasons why I was so drawn to you when I saw you on stage for the first time. 
because I recognize this language that you're speaking. And I was so curious. Um, you know, I've also just FYI, I would also love to talk to Neil Seif, send her an email because this show, I want to get different perspectives. So hopefully, you know, she'll be interested in coming on as well. It's not, it's not you. Believe me, she is so behind the scenes. She's just okay. so <laughs> profile. She doesn't like the camera. I, we were talking this morning about, you know, her book, like she, she could write a fantastic book. You know, r really, she, she has so many women that come to her for advice. Uh, the fact that her and I have been married for 31 years, there is a section in my book that talks about relationships. I went in there like I went there and, you know, that part that that whole section could be a whole nother, you know, episode on your program here. Sure. The, the significance of a significant other relationship pressure creates diamonds or crushes the union. How to how to marry your guardian angel are all titles to chapters in my book because yeah. relationships in business and in life are I mean, they're everything. everything. Exactly. You, everything. So why well, not maybe do right? we could do a joint interview with both of you. We, she's done that. Okay. Done that. Well, all right. So see there, where there's a will, there's a way. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> but um, thank you so much. I, I honestly, we could, I think you and I could do a three hour show. I have so many other questions, but I hope you will come back because this, I believe that, you know, again, the purpose uh, my passion is my music and creating it and writing it and performing and all of that. At 57, I just started my new band. <laughs> wow, great. Um, but I've always known that my purpose was to help others. And I am trying to do that with my hemp CBD skincare line because I created it for, you know, I created it in honor of my mom who died of cancer. And I wish that I had been knowledgeable enough while I was trying to care for her. And I wish I had this information. So that project is the number one project that's in my heart right now is I'm creating products that are clean and healthy enough so that cancer warriors don't have to worry about it. Yeah, that's beautiful. And that way, all of us can use it. Yes. Beautiful. But I love this format, which, you know, we, we've also talked in the past about pivoting and how we have to just, life throws us curveballs. I lost everything, like so many people during the pandemic, you know, last year, and I had to recreate. And I found this another passion of doing these interviews and talking to people and learning, but also sharing. So yeah. thank you for being so candid and so open. And I hope you will come back and join me again, Frank. Well, if you want more of that candid and openness, that authenticity, transparency, and vulnerability, you know what to do. Pick up a copy of that book, Aspire, How to Create Own Reality and Alter Your DNA. Every book we sell provides 200 meals in one of our orphanages. So go to the aspirebook.com. By the way, Carmen, when they're at the aspirebook.com, I don't know if you've been there recently, but you can read a chapter for free. You can you can listen to a chapter on Audible, a separate chapter yes, for free. That's very you can exciting. See yeah, you can see where the tour went. You can see, I mean, e everything on this book before you decide to buy it. When you buy it, it's 200 meals in our orphanage. So it's a win, win, win. Yes. Yes, it is. So for everyone that has joined us today, our guest today has been Frank McKinney. This is From the Ground Up, and we also give you insights on how to build your reality from the inside out. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Frank. I appreciate you so much. And we'll have to do this again. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Wait, we're not done yet. I just had to say, wow, wow, wow. I don't know if you could tell by my interview that I just had with author, seven-time best-selling author, philanthrocapitalist, ultramarathoner, Frank McKinney. But you know when there's sometimes where you just meet people where they really inspire you because of the work that they're doing, because of their passion for helping others, because of their passion for changing the world. I just wanted to say very quickly, this show means so much more to me than I ever thought. And it's because of guests like Katie Kay, JT Fox, Frank McKinney, and all the other upcoming guests that I get to spend time with. So I just wanted to say thank you for tuning in. Thank you, Frank McKinney, 
for writing such an incredible book, Aspire, How to Create Your Own Reality and Alter Your DNA. I hope that you all get a chance to read this book, not only to transform your own life, but you will most definitely be able to transform the life of children and families in Haiti. I've said it before. I'll say it again. Transformational success starts with the truth from the ground up and from the inside out. Thanks again. Once again, I'm Carmen Milagro. This is From the Ground Up, and I wish you all a healthy lifestyle journey as you continue to build wealth and maintain your health, emotional, spiritual, and physical. Thanks again, everyone. Thanks for allowing me this little show tag.